Globalists love racism. Why is that? That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. You ever wonder why Democrats seem to love racism so badly, seem to see racism everywhere, point to racist white people everywhere, point out racism, even in places where Most people just don't see it. Most people are puzzled by the accusations of racism. And yet, this is what the left does. Well, let me tell you, it's by design, right? It's by purposeful, strategic design. Because the more the left can divide, the more the left has a chance to conquer. And racism is something that, well, globalists, they just love it because it's just such a great tool to oppress, control, and exert their boot-stomping powers on the people. Before I get into all that, I want to quickly mention, if you like Bold and Blunt, you can get Bold and Blunt. Where? At edify.app. That is the online platform for your faith-based podcast. Where else? At washingtontimes.com. Just go there, find my name, click on it, scroll to the bottom of one of my pieces, and you'll see some easy-peasy directions to sign up for my three times a week newsletter at the Washington Times. You'll get all my commentaries giving you all the bullet points, talking points, and fact-based analyses you need to fight the far-left globalists who want to steal America's freedoms. So you'll get that, but you'll also get my twice-weekly Bold and Blunt podcast. And guess what? You can get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. Yes, wherever. And remember, those of you who already subscribe to Bold and Blunt or subscribe to my Washington Times newsletter, you have a special place in my heart. I really do appreciate your support and humbly thank you for all you do. Globalists and their love of racism. You know, it's not a, it's not a figment of imagination to see how the globalists of the world just rub their hands in glee whenever, whenever Democrats are able to cry racism in America. That's because the more divisions that can be created, the more chaos is generated, the more chaotic the people become, and the more panic-driven the masses also become about solutions to calm the chaos. And here comes your happy neighborhood communist with the idea of calming calming the situation by exerting more power, influence, regulatory controls. That's how freedom gets lost. That's how individuals cede their liberties to government all in the name of safety and security, right? Just look back at the two plus years of the coronavirus and what happened there? American citizens, especially American citizens, gave up liberties so cherished in previous generations, all because of fear, all because of the leftist wielding of fear as a tool of power and control. You don't want to die, do you? Well, You better stay home from church. You better shut down those schools and keep your kids at home with you. But that's okay because the parents are already at home because they, based on government advisements, have already stayed home from work. Don't go to the beach. Don't go to the park. Don't ride the subway. We've got the police watching you and they will arrest you, as we saw on several amazing, astonishing videos from the coronavirus crazy. Never thought that would happen in America. See videos of a guy running on a beach, an empty beach, a vacant beach, completely by himself in the fresh air, which by the way, didn't your mom used to tell you to go outside and get some fresh air so you don't get sick, staying inside cooped up in the air of your home, in the bubble of your home? Yes, that's how I grew up. But anyhow, remember the video that guy running down the beach I forget where. Was it California? You know it was controlled by a leftist. And that officer trying to chase him and arrest him. Remember the video of the guy taking his kids to the park, that vacant park, that empty park, trying to get his kids to take in a little fresh air? Because, again, remember how fresh air used to be good for your body, used to be good for your immune system? 
well, not under the coronavirus, when the government is in control. Remember the video of that guy getting arrested? Remember the video of the guy getting dragged off the metro system or the T system, the subway system, because he didn't have a face mask on, dragged off by several police officers. It's a wonder he wasn't beaten to death. His crime of not wearing a face mask endangered the lives of others. People could die, people could die, people could die. This is how government wielded fear to control the masses. And shame on those who knew better, who knew that it was all just a government strategy to control the masses and went along with it anyhow. Shame on those people who saw on their local store front windows, face masks required for entry. It's the law. And instead of going in without a face mask and making the manager or some store employee come over to them to tell them to put their face mask on and therefore have the opportunity to explain What's the law? There is no law. Show me the law. Instead, eh, Americans by and large in the masses put the face masks on, went in and did their shopping. Why? Who wants to start trouble? Who wants to start an issue? I don't want to be embarrassed now, do I? Well, guess what? Some of us out here did. Some of us out here refused to play along and did, in fact, have situations of refusing to wear face masks, being put in uncomfortable situations with management and store employees who wanted to pretend like they were the law. I am the law. Put that face mask on, comrade. And guess what? Some of us didn't play and some of us won the argument because in the end, guess what? There was no law. These weren't lawful dictates. These weren't lawful orders. They were simply government-issued decrees, government-issued advisements. And too many Americans went along with it anyhow. So that's a long way of leading back into how the left, how globalists in particular, like to use divisions to create openings in which they can then insert themselves as being the savior of humanity. We saw it under two plus years of the coronavirus, how government, how leftists, Democrats in particular, bureaucrats, globalists, used the fear of the virus to justify clampdowns on individual freedoms and seizures of individual liberties that, by the way, in this country are God-given or are supposed to be God-given, except when citizens don't insist on them and then they're government-granted. And that's exactly what happened under two years of the coronavirus. But back to the topic at hand, the the globalists love to create divisions because then it gives them the in they need to come in and play the solver of the chaos that results. And so the coronavirus fear was one way of creating division because if you did not go along, then you were billed as endangering humanity, as putting other people's lives at risk. And so the division was the sheep versus the non-sheep, and the government successfully painted the non-sheep as the dangers of society and even the killers of humanity. And so that's just one way. And now look at racism. That is one of the go-to cards of the left. It's a very successful play because nobody wants to be labeled a racist. As soon as somebody says, you're a racist, you know, everybody goes fleeing. Everybody runs for the hills. I don't want to be called a racist. I don't want, I don't want people to think of me as a racist. Well, you know what? A lot of times people aren't racist when they're called racist. They're just called racist by a left that loves to sling that card, loves to sling that R word because they know that it shuts down dissenting opinion. You know, they know the debate stops there and it doesn't matter whether they win or lose the debate. It just matters that they successfully shut down the other side. They stifled the countering viewpoints. So Democrats have been using the race card for a very long time in America. Barack Obama, especially, uh, being a black president who was elected by a, a, a large portion of white voters, you would have thought that would have put the end to the idea of America being inherently racist 
or having, <clears throat> excuse me, at its foundation, in its founding documents, racism, but it did not. It only heightened the racist divide in America because it was the strategy of the Barack Obama administration to use racism, particularly in the field of law enforcement and criminal justice, to create divides where they could cause this chaos and then swoop in as the government saviors of a problem that the government itself created. So globalists watching from afar saw how great, how great this racist tool was for the Barack Obama administration. And they, of course, love it when America is in turmoil divided by race. Because not only does it allow Democrats to seize power and liberties in America, but it allows the globalists with their friends in the Democrat Party to also seize powers and American liberties. And more than that, justify its intervention into matters that should be for sovereign governments to deal with. And what do I mean by that? Well, listen to this. It came from the United Nations, September 2022. This headline, Little Progress Combating Systemic Racism Against People of African Descent. It was a UN report, and here's the summary from it. More than two years since the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in the United States sparked the global Black Lives Matter movement, there's been only piecemeal progress in addressing systemic racism, the UN Human Rights Office said in a new report. Why would the United, the United Nations be looking at the United States when it comes to racism when it comes to talking about divisions of people by race and discriminatory practices. Out of all the nations in the world, it's America via the Constitution through its case law, through its precedents, through its civil rights legislation and laws that provides an equal playing ground for all to pursue life, liberty, and happiness in this country. Fact is, if you're discriminated against in this country based on your skin color or your sex, then you have many, many legal means in which to pursue redress against that discrimination. The courts are there. The courts are filled with cases of people saying that they were discriminated against wrongfully based on skin color. And you know what? They actually win quite a few of them. So for the United Nations to take up the cause of so-called systemic racism, referencing a case in America as an example of systemic racism in a government is unbelievably, astonishingly uncalled for. And yet, this is how globalists weave their influences into so-called sovereign governments. The globalists love when America is ripped by racism, even though the so-called racism is largely a fabrication of the leftists who love to exploit race for political gain. And I have a guest today. I have a really good guest today. I'm very excited he's here. Kevin McGarry. He has written this book, Woked Up, Finally Putting an Axe to the Taproot of White Supremacy and Racism in America. But he also is co-founder of Every Black Life Matters and chairman of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of California. Kevin, I want to thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. Wow, Cheryl, it's a, it's a great honor for me to be here, so thank you for having me. Oh, of course, of course. I, I, I love your viewpoint. Uh, on one hand, you are the co-founder of Every Black Life Matters, but on the other hand, you think Donald Trump is America's candidate of choice, of even necessity, in 2024. And this would seem in direct conflict with how the media paints the black community with Donald Trump. Absolutely. Um, it's not because of a, um, well, so first of all, when we say every black life matters, we mean from conception to natural death. So uh, every phase of life uh, in between. So uh, to set the record straight, what I'm really saying is 
uh, Donald Trump had done more for black life than any other president in modern history. So uh, it's not hard to envision why we would uh, support uh, Trump uh, as the uh, ideal candidate for 2024. The other parts of it, though, however, is we are absolutely, we, we, we fully understand what happens with a lower and middle income family when they are decimated by socialism, Marxism, communism, any of the, uh, of course, uh, Karl Marx, any of his uh, paths and trajectory to the ultimate goal of communism. So what happens in that case, uh, you know, your poor middle income families are completely devastated and decimated. And we are on a path uh, to communism here in the United States. So. Uh, the point that I was making is, look, if we want to put a roadblock in the path towards globalism by way of World Economic Forum and Council of Foreign Relations and all of the other, you know, uh, globalist moves in that, then there's only one person that fully now understands what to do globally to forestall that and, uh, and then also what he fully understands what to do within our own uh, government here in the United States uh, because he is face-to-face, he has been face-to-face with the deep state and deep state actors for the past six years consistently. And no other person has that kind of background. So it's not a slight on any of the other, you know, wonderful candidates or potentially wonderful candidates. It's just if we want to forestall uh, you know, the globalist move and the deep state moves to get us into the whole globalist uh, uh, cabal, then we, we have to put somebody who has been uh, fully targeted, who has been fighting, who, uh, you know, the deep state and the globalists for six years, uh, somebody that understands uh, which departments need to be, uh, you know, sort of reinvigorated and, and renewed. So, um so that's the point. That was the point I was making with the, with the article. And, and I agree with you completely. Trump is the guy who took on the deep state and sees the threat of this great reset Davos global elitist crowd. Uh, but you, you, this is such a great opportunity to talk about so many different things with you. I want to get into Trump and the great reset and all that with you. But I want to talk first about the black community in America, because it, it's very distressing, whether you're white, black, or no matter your skin color, it's very distressing to see uh, a segment of American population in such peril. Just look at the abortion rates and the broken home rates that impact this one uh, segment of American demographics. And I just, I would like your take on this. When did this happen to the black community? What's going on? And specifically, you said Trump did more than anyone else for the black community. What do you mean? Okay, excellent, excellent point. So when this happened was when we had a president who had a scheme, and it's, it's well documented, this scheme, he says we're going to have those N-words voting for the Democrat Party for the next 200 years. So he basically dismissively and, and racially, racistly, uh, castigated blacks as, as, as dumb, ignorant, and uh, all you have to do is give them some... Uh, little tidbits, and they'll be voting Democrats for the next 200 years. That particular president was London, or Lyndon Baines Johnson. Right. Okay? And when LBJ said that, what he did is he, he started the welfare state in earnest. And what I mean by that is he says, look, what we want to do is want to make sure that these, uh, these families, and especially black families, do not have men in the household. He gave special incentives. And, 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 and ordained a, a, a army of people who would check on uh, people who were on uh, government assistance, uh, you know, welfare and any types of government assistance. They would go to these houses and they would say, look, do you have any men here? Um, and you would have to say no, and they would look around to make sure there's no shoes in that. Then they would actually provide additional monthly income for those women who would do that. So when you take the male, when you take the father out of the house, you really uh, leave the entire family vulnerable, and you leave them vulnerable to a, uh, a dependent state, 
on the state, and, and that's why black women, by and large, uh, we've made a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of black men peel off from the Democrat Party uh, as of the past four years, but black women are really a, a stalwart part of the Democrat Party base uh, because they have been, um, you know, unfortunately brainwashed to believe that the government can actually do things well and are actually working in their best interest. So, so bottom line is, is that that's what I meant by that. Now, as it relates to Donald Trump and what he did for the black family, uh, let's just go through history. Uh, Donald Trump decided that, look, we have so many cities, happen to be in our uh, large metropolitan urban areas, black areas, brown areas, uh, that are dilapidated. Um, we need to come up with uh, ways to actually reinvigorate these parts of the city and actually bring economic uh, prosperity again to these communities, and he started the uh, uh, and, uh, the opportunity zones. Uh, he started with uh, uh, tax incentives and investment on on capital. You have to pay capital gains. There was a way that you could, as a taxpayer, then uh, you know go through a opportunity zone fund, and then basically there was a lot of redevelopment then funded within some of these dilapidated communities. And so now we saw a reinvigoration and an economic base for blacks. With that, we saw black unemployment at the lowest levels in, what, 50, 60, 70 years uh, or more. Uh, could have been historic levels. We saw, um, we saw black home ownership at the highest level historically. Um, we saw uh, black families, uh, you know, actually coming together again because he... He, uh, he, he undid the Joe Biden and Bill Clinton 1994 crime bill to, to some degree. I mean, he, it takes a long time to take that apart. But if you recall, uh, it was Joe Biden who beat his chest about taking those urban predators off the street for a little $5 amount of crack. <laughs> uh, while, of course, you know, your white, you know, cocaine drug dealers that had kilos or more were getting three to five years. Blacks were getting 25 years to life. And uh, President Trump is the first president in our history who recognized that, look, this is disproportional. This was racial, racially targeting blacks and the black community to, to, to destroy the family. And he started uh, with criminal justice reforms. He, uh, I think he, he freed uh, a few thousand people, mostly black, who were in, uh, in prison for very minor crimes, especially in considering today's uh, you know, uh, crime ethics. So, so anyway, that, that, that's what I meant, and that, that's what he's done for the black community. And, and so many more things. I mean, historically black colleges, he gave them funding for 10 years. They didn't have to come and grovel every year. These are things that Obama could have easily have done. These are things that, uh, you know, Clinton or, or Bush or anybody could have done, but they didn't. It was uh, Donald John Trump who actually did these things that actually helped significantly in the black community. One of the things that I detested about the Barack Obama administration was the way that he divided America uh, by race, by class, and so forth. And I, I think that he actually fueled a victim-type mentality, not just among the black community, which is, has been decimated in recent times based on uh, that type of attitude in part, but all of Americans, all of America uh, with the victim-type mentality that actually opens the door for the global government to come in and, and sway policy and politics. Can you respond to that, how that led into the uh, open-door invitation to the elite in, in Davos and the global crowd? Yeah, so, so first of all, we have to understand that Barack Obama had a completely different mindset than uh, a real embrace of, of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution and all those things. Now, surely he, when he was sworn in, he sworn to the Constitution that, but he had, a, he had a completely different, he was a progressive. Progressive means that, look, you can't hold me accountable to any standards because I can easily just say, I progressed beyond that. I evolved, like you did with the uh, homosexual thing. But uh, fundamentally, Barack Obama was a divider-in-chief. I mean, and I, you know, I think I can debate anybody on that point. I mean, America was so divided. Had a great opportunity, however, to unite America, because he was, he was at least half, uh, he was at least, uh, you know, a half, you know, African-American, half white. So, he had the opportunity to actually bring all races to the table and say, look, you know, we we got to stop this. But instead, he put his, his, pedal, his, foot, his foot on the pedal, put the pedal to the metal, and uh, we saw an acceleration of racial
racial animus and distrust and disdain between the races. And that was primarily because of his talking points that, well, you know, a lot of stuff's happening because uh, your media is so hard on me because I'm a black man. A lot of stuff is happening because, uh, you know, blacks don't get a fair shake. Uh, a lot of stuff is happening because, you know, black this and black that. And so, and, and white supremacy and this and that. So, so that was really what unleashed our ultra-sensitive now uh, state that we're in. Uh, we, we're overly racial sensitized. Uh, right now as a society and culture. And, um, and that opens the door then for agitation because what happens is these globalists, uh, they're trying to get the United States into this great reset. They've already made great strides with the digital currency uh, via Joe Biden's uh, executive order, 14067, he signed in March of this year, um, that, that puts us on track for digital currency where, where then they can you know, scrutinize every single financial transaction or stop your ability by itself, whatever. Uh, so, so we're so that opens that door uh, to that. But more importantly, what happens is if we can, if we have a president that throws up his arms, throws up his hands, says, "Look, I can't control the streets. We got so much chaos, so much racial animus, so much uh, division and dissension in America. Uh, we really need help from the UN. We need help from global entities to come in here and help us to maintain control of the streets." Um, that's what this sets in motion. And so we really could quite easily have uh, race wars here in the United States. We got very, very close in 2020. Um, and, uh, and it's just by God's grace that we are not there already. But if that were to happen, you know, Biden would throw up his arms and say, look, I can't do anything. I need, the, you know, global uh, police forces here in the United States to calm down the streets, et cetera. And then we'd be... Um, you know, part of that one world apparatus. Uh, so that's the, that's the whole plan, though, is to create racial chaos and animosity and then, uh, you know, basically be folded into uh, the UN and, and World Economic Forum and all this uh, great reset stuff that they have in mind. Time flies, and so let, let me let me ask you this one last question because I, I, our time's pretty much at an end. Uh, say, best-case scenario, Trump does win in 2024, and to me, that's that's my best-case scenario, scenario for the same reasons that you put forward, that Trump is the one guy who understands the Great Reset and Deep State and so forth. Will it be too late after two more years of Joe Biden pushing through, as you talked about this new currency and all the things that Joe Biden is doing to allow globalism and globalists to take control of America and cripple our U.S. Constitution? Will it be too late in 2024 for even someone like Donald Trump to uh, bring us back to a time of American exceptionalism. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I think that if we don't have any change whatsoever, if we have Biden-Harris, nobody drops dead, everybody's healthy, <laughs> everybody goes through, Biden decides to run again in 2024, uh, it may be too late by that time. But I, I think over the next two years, and time will tell, there'll be a lot of additional things that will happen to the U.S. economy, and a lot of additional things will happen to those in, in, uh, in power at all levels. Um, so, you know, we have, I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure whether 2024 will be too late, although I do believe that if you put a relative neophyte, and, and that by that I mean like a DeSantis, for instance, um, I love him, and he's going to be great. He's right. going to be exceptional as a president when it's his time. Right. But if you put him in office right now, what's going to happen is they'll get an additional two to three years for DeSantis to figure out what's what, who's who, how's how. And by that time, it will be too late. So that's my point is, folks, look, we absolutely want DeSantis in office at some point. But we right now, we need somebody to go in there and fight and shut this stuff down. And if we are still a republic in 2024... In, in my opinion, Trump's the only one that can go in day one and take us out of these treaties and take us out of all this globalist crap that we're in right now and start to dismantle that stuff. But uh, if not, we're going to have to wait another few years. And by that time, I think it would be too late. That's the point. I couldn't agree with you more, Kevin. Kevin McGeary, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I, I, I would love to have you back to discuss um, race issues more in depth and the Great Reset more in depth in, in the new year if you're interested. Absolutely. Please do. And please read my book. I don't know if you've actually seen it yet, but it is incredible. 
uh, talking about the woke movement. It's called Woke Up. It's on Amazon. Uh, it'll get to you in a couple of days. But it, 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 it's really, really an incredible book. Everything's, uh, you know, online, footnoted. Everything's there. So uh, get my book, and I think uh, have me back, and let's talk about that as well. Your book sounds crucial for these times. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, so much. Awesome. Thank you. The book title, if you missed it, is called Woked Up, Finally Putting an Axe to the Taproot of White Supremacy and Racism in America. It's on Amazon. It's got some great ratings. Check it out. Very important book for these times. If you like Bold and Blunt, I want to remind you, you can get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, the online platform for faith-based podcasts at washingtontimes.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you already subscribe to Bold and Blunt, thank you so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Tune in, tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, stay blunt, stay bold.